Hi, my name is Patrick, and today I'll be speaking about the most prevalent healthcare inequality surrounding the global transgender community. I'll also be giving an insight onto certain aspects of the transition that often go under, un, unconsidered from a global health perspective. But before that, I'd like to give a quick introduction to myself. I am a rising senior at the University of Toronto Schools in Toronto, Canada, and I hope to one day pursue a degree in biology and public health. My main goal as an individual is to help ameliorate the lives of LGBTQ plus individuals around the world, as although great deals of progress have been made with regards to our rights and freedoms, certain aspects of our experience are still greatly lacking, namely healthcare. For now, I work within my school and my community as an advocate and activist for queer rights and equality. So, now, transitioning is a highly nuanced and largely novel concept to many. So before exploring the global health issues themselves, I'd like to first delve into some basics behind transgenderism. The dictionary defines transgender people as those whose gender identity differs from the sex that they were assigned at birth. But this is quite ambiguous and leaves a great amount of room for confusion and misunderstanding. To understand this better, it's important to define certain key terms that are often associated with the trans community. Sex is purely biological, linked directly to one's karyotype or primary sex characteristics. Gender identity, which is not biological, is a personal sense of one's own gender. This is often correlated to sex, but it's important not to conflate the two. And gender expression is the outward manifestation of said gender identity, shown through mannerisms, interests, clothing, etc. To further contextualize, it'd be useful to view these concepts as continua rather than binaries, this as visualized in this image. Now, to understand why so many global health issues plague the trans community, it's important to consider transphobia and how that impacts wider societal attitudes. Here's a helpful graphic that depicts various forms of transphobia around the world, ranging from cis sexism, which is the assertion that everyone is innately cisgender, to, the, to violence, which is the act of harassment and brutality solely on the basis of transgenderism. Oh, the issues I'm discussing today mainly stem from the discrimination tier, which is linked to the denigration of trans individuals in the realm of housing, job opportunities, finances, and namely, healthcare. Now, one would assume that trans individuals, despite the fact that they only make up around 0.6% of the population, should be given access to the same equitable health care as their cisgender counterparts. In practice, however, this is rarely the case. Trans people are consistently discriminated against, discriminated against making safe, quality health care woefully inaccessible. In my research, I've observed that there were three main barriers against the global health of trans people. They are unequipped physicians, bigoted legislation, and insufficient mental health care. To begin, I'll discuss how unequipped physicians can be detrimental to a trans person's journey. Now, for those who don't know, transitioning can often have a medical aspect to it. Although there's no, by no means a standard way to transition, a typical medical journey goes as follows. You need to meet with a psychiatrist to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. You need to work with an endocrinologist to begin hormone replacement therapy. If you so choose, you need to consult a plastic surgeon to achieve a face or body that is more in line with your gender identity. And finally, many need to find specialized surgeons that can perform the tumultuous gender confirmation surgery. Seeing how inextricably linked doctors are to the trans person's journey, one would hope that physicians are highly trained and skilled when it comes to treating these patients. Yet, the reality shows otherwise. In a recent survey conducted with internal medicine students, 45% said that they had no education on trans health care, 48% cited a lack of lack of training as a barrier to treating trans patients, and 31% claimed to feel unprepared when it came to caring for trans people. These figures truly show how medical schools globally base their curricula upon principles that overlook trans struggles. Not only does this make a medical transition more cumbersome and long-winded, but it can also have far more detrimental implications. Take, for example, the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Recently, around the world, cases on average have been lessening, but with such great disparity in the healthcare system, trans people aren't getting the care they need to prevent or treat the disease. Take the 1 million trans people in the USA. 9.2% have HIV, whereas only 0.5% of the entire adult population of the U in the US has the disease. This is only one country and one example of hundreds in which we can see that trans people are at an intrinsic disadvantage due to doctors' apprehension to treat them. Next up, we have the global health barrier of bigoted legislation. 
I'd like to hearken back to the pyramid of transphobia so as to better understand why bigoted legislation is passed in the first place. The different levels of transphobia are practically baked into international psyche, which leads to very pernicious attitudes and actions. These attitudes give way to things like misgendering or dead naming, all the way to murder and brutality. Nevertheless, no matter the severity, these actions are part of a willful ignorance that lead to bigoted lawmaking that eventually renders life worse for transgender people. To explore further, I'd like to present a case study. In April, Arkansas lawmakers voted in clear majority to pass a bill that would ban medical treatment of transgender youth. This decision was made despite the pleas of pediatricians and social workers, noting that they need to get they need to be 18 before making those kinds of decisions. What people like Representative Lundstrom fail to consider are the implications behind these kinds of decisions. Not only is Arkansas setting a negative precedent for other regions of the world to follow, but they're also spreading a highly transphobic rhetoric, one that is based off solely stereotypes and misconceptions. Furthermore, the decision is scientifically ignorant. It's been found time and time again that transitioning before puberty makes life far easier for trans individuals, not to mention that a medical aspect to youth transition is often limited to hormone blockers, a completely reversible process. The worst thing is that the decision will ultimately lead to increased suicide and depression rates amongst trans youth in the state. This leads me to the final barrier for trans people, insufficient mental health care. With all the struggles aforementioned, from legal to social marginalization, it's not hard to imagine why trans people often have terrible mental health. This, combined with the fact that there are few places where they can get the help that they need, leads to figures like these ones. It's been shown that among trans people, internationally, 44.1% have clinical depression, 33.2% have anxiety, and 27.5% have experienced somatization. These three figures are all greater than international averages, which is a staggering testament to the mental health issues that this community faces. But nothing comes close to the terrifying notion that 41% of trans people attempt suicide at one point in their life, which is 26 times higher than the general population. To think that so many believe that they're better off dead than living in our society truly speaks to how tremendous the struggles they face are. This is completely unacceptable. To close off, we need to think about how to remediate the three main global health injustices highlighted earlier on. While completely shifting society's perception of the community will take generations, changes to legislation and healthcare access can be done today. On an individual basis, we can make efforts to unlearn transphobic biases, ensure that we're educated about their plight, especially if we're going into healthcare, actively fight against the bigotry, bigotry they face, and create safer spaces in which they can thrive as themselves. So these are my references. My acknowledgements go out to Dr. Jennifer Galley, who is an endocrinologist, without whom I would not be able to understand the complex biology behind transitioning, and Dr. Francine Brill, who is a psychiatrist, who allowed me to gain an incredibly nuanced insight onto the mental health aspect behind um, gender dysphoria and trans people. Um, so thank you so much. That's my contact info on the screen, and I hope you enjoyed.